started. Welcome to Winning the Vote, A Brief History of Voting Rights. This is a multicultural community event. Uh, thank you all for coming here on Monday morning. Before we get started, I just have a couple of announcements. You should have an evaluation form uh, um, in your hands. If you don't, uh, there will be more copies coming. Please take some time at the end to fill out that evaluation form. We rely on your feedback to provide or present more events like this uh, of topics of interest to you. Uh, also, if you need to leave early, please do so quietly. There are exit doors to the back and the side door here. This event will be taped. And it will be, the link will be available to you on Facebook. So go to Facebook and, and like us. Um, all right, so Professor, Associate Professor of History, Donald Kildas, is our uh, speaker today. Uh, Professor Kildas has been teaching at DCC full time since uh, two, 2008. He teaches US history and all of the government classes over here. Um, he's also the chair of the history department and faculty advisor to Phi Theta Kappa, which is the honors society for two-year colleges. His interests include U.S. history, American government, civil war, evolution of American presidency, and presidential elections. He will be speaking today about voting rights, which is a very timely discussion considering elections just around the corner. Um, and so if you can please join me in welcoming Professor Kildas. Thank you very much. Just the way every class starts for me on this campus, as soon as I walk in, the applause starts. So. Um, well, welcome this morning, and I'm usually not used to using a mic, so maybe I'll keep it like this. Um, the Founding Fathers, when they established the Constitution in 1787, established a government for the United States that is what we refer to as a republic or representative democracy. And one of the cornerstones of any type of government, but especially one that is a republic like ours, is that people will exercise their right to vote. And I know that most people, as you look around and you think about things, well, what does my vote really matter? Does my vote really matter? Well, when you think back, before I get into the Electoral College and, and some of the other issues, think back to, for example, well, we can't think back, we weren't there. But if you look back, for example, in history, in Massachusetts in 1839, Marcus Morton was elected governor of the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts by one popular vote. One. When you look, for example, at Andrew Johnson, the first American president to ever have been impeached, he was not convicted and removed by one vote within Congress. Ruth Rudd B. Hayes, in 1877, in a disputed presidential election, wins the presidency, as you can guess, by one vote. Exactly. Again, it was a disputed presidential election in terms of the commission. Harry Byrne, we'll talk about in a little bit, because he has something to do with women's suffrage. And then more recently, a Rhode Island uh, representative in, in uh, the House will actually, he just won his primary seat, and he's actually running unopposed, so he won his seat in the Rhode Island House by one popular vote in 2012. So when you think that your vote doesn't matter, it can actually change history. All right, so just give that some thought as we kind of move on here today. But what I'd like to begin with before I start about women and, and African American suffrage is just a brief overview about what the Electoral College is, what it does. And one very obviously important thing to keep us, for, for us all to keep in mind is that the states are the ones who determine who can vote in all elections. So that it's up to the states to determine unless the federal government has superseded them, which they have done on several occasions, it's up to the states to decide who can and who cannot vote in all elections across this country. That's why, for example, the rules are a little bit different in terms of residency requirements, in terms of, for example, in some states, felons can never vote again, for example. In other states, they can vote shortly after being released from prison, and so on and so forth. So it's up to the states to determine who can and who cannot vote. And with the Electoral College system, the way we set it up is it's also the responsibility of the states to choose the electors. Now, originally, they used many different methods of choosing the electors, but today they're all elected by our popular vote. 
So back in the day, in the early um, 1800s, in many cases, that the state legislatures chose, but today it's actually up to um, the popular vote to actually appoint who the electors will be, who actually, as we'll see in a second, will be the ones who cast our votes for president and vice president. Now, the electors, they only say in the Constitution, very specifically, cannot be any federal employee. So no federal employee can actually serve as an elector. So a US senator, a US representative cannot serve as an elector, for example. But could the governor of Massachusetts serve? Yes. Could the governor, yes, why? Because that's a state office, correct? Could a member of the State House of Massachusetts serve? Absolutely. Could Newman from Seinfeld serve? <laughs> why not Newman? Ah, he's a post office employee, exactly. So no Newman Kramer could, which is a scarier thought, but anyway. Um, so no federal employee can actually serve as an elector. And then we have what we use today is a winner-take-all system in 48 of the 50 states. Meaning if you win, if President Obama or Mitt Romney, for example, Governor Romney, wins the popular vote of a state by one popular vote, by a thousand popular votes, by two million popular votes, he will win the entire state's electoral votes. That's what we mean by a winner-take-all system. The, only, the other two states do it a slightly different manner. They use a, um, a district system where they kind of break up their electoral votes a little bit differently. Those two states are Maine and Nebraska. But this winner-take-all system obviously allows you to kind of allows us the opportunity, I suppose we should say, to increase an electoral victory, which actually increases a president's legitimacy upon entering office. So it kind of exaggerates a victory in many cases, and we'll talk about that probably in a few minutes. But what about the Electoral College itself? Now, the Electoral College, the total number of electoral votes is 538. Now, the number of, of electoral votes each state gets is actually equal to the number of members of the House of Representatives and the number of US Senators that each state has. So for example, today Massachusetts has how many members of the House of Representatives? Anybody know? How many members in the? Nine. Nine, someone said nine, exactly. Nine is actually the number. Nine is actually the number of members of the House of Representatives that Massachusetts has. And every state has how many Senators? Two. So when you look across the board, that Rhode Island has, for example, two members of the House, two senators. So Rhode Island has four electoral votes. Massachusetts today obviously has 11 electoral votes. So when you add up all the members of the House, how many members are there in the House of Representatives today across the board? I'm hearing some different numbers. What, Jamie? Well, 435 in the House, right, 435 in the House. And therefore, how many U.S. senators are there? 100, so they're 50 states. So we get 435 members of the House plus 100 U.S. Senators gives us 538 electoral votes. Those are the numbers of electoral votes that each state has. What's the matter? Did I make a mistake? <laughs> Mathematically? 438 plus 100 equals 538. Oh no, wait a minute, what did I miss? There are three electoral votes out there, right? What area is treated as a state every four years, but is not actually a state? Brandy. Ah, District of Columbia, exactly. So the District of Columbia acts like a state every four years. They get so happy, it's a joyous thing. And they actually get three electoral votes. All right, so we have 538 electoral votes out there to elect the president and vice president of the United States. Now these electors meet in 51 different places. There is no such place as the Electoral College. There is no such place. They meet in the state capitals, and they also meet in the District of Columbia. So that's the 51 different places. The state capitals plus DC. Now, when these electors are chosen by the states, again, they're chosen based upon your popular vote, they will actually go to the Electoral College in December. They go to the state college, the, the, excuse me, the state capitol. And in the state capitol, they'll actually vote for two persons. One person obviously running for president, one person running obviously for vice president. And in order to be elected president or vice president, you must win a majority of the electoral votes 
for president and vice president, respectively. So that's why you hear on the media, in the media, for example, all the time, that what is the number they keep looking at? What is the magic number for Romney and for Obama? They keep going back and forth with all the time. It's always 270, 270, 270. Why is it 270? Because half of 538 is 269, and you need a majority. So 269 plus 1 is 270. That's why the electoral math is always focused on that magic 270 number. Okay? Now, when these electors cast their votes, as I said, they vote for two persons, one for president, one for vice president. Then once they cast their votes, those um, votes are actually going to, if they don't total a 270, then the election, if, for example, there's a tie, or if there are three candidates running for president, for example, so no one gets a, to that 270 number, what would happen is the election would then either be thrown to the House, if the presidency is up, for example, or to the Senate if it's for the vice president. So that's why there are some scenarios out there today, for example, that say that perhaps the election today could come up at 269 time. There are some mathematical formulations where that could happen. And if that happens, what, where would it go? Obviously, the Obama-Romney race would be decided by the House, and the race between Ryan and Biden would be decided by the U.S. Senate. Then the, the votes are sealed, and they're sent on to the president of the Senate, who, by the way, who is the president of the Senate? Vice the vice president of the United States. And he gets the privilege of actually opening the ballots. Now, that can be a double-edged sword this time, because let's say Romney wins the presidency. Who's the vice president of the United States today? Biden. Oh, he gets to announce that <laughs> Romney and Ryan have just beaten Obama and Biden. Ouch. Okay. Yeah, so that can be kind of a double-edged sword sometimes. But um, that's what we see in terms of the Electoral College, in terms of the vote itself. Now, when you go into the ballot box, uh, excuse me, when you go to vote and you go into your little booth or whatnot, this is actually a copy a few years ago that I asked for very nicely and they gave it to me, um, of a ballot that I kind of blew up here for you, where it shows us obviously from 2004, where you see obviously John Kerry and John Edwards and George W. Bush and Dick Cheney among the other candidates there as well. The only thing I want to highlight here is you look up in that shaded region, it says presidential electors for. It doesn't say your vote for. Because technically, folks, when you go in to vote, who are you voting for? These groups of electors, whether they be the Democratic electors, you know, in this case for Kerry and Edwards, or the Republican electors for Bush and Cheney. Those are the, the people that you're voting for, technically, those slate of electors. And if you look around, for example, when you go to vote in a couple weeks, you'll probably see a sheet like this one that actually lists down who these different electors are. So because Rhode Island obviously has four electoral votes, each party has four different, I mean, there are a couple that only have two, but they, um, each party usually has four different individuals who are actually going to serve as the electors that if you will choose them, they pledge that when they go to the Electoral College, what will they do? They will vote for the Republican team or they'll vote for the Democratic team. All right? So that's kind of just a brief overview of what the Electoral College does. And one of the key reasons we still use the Electoral College today is because, and one of the reasons the Founding Fathers created it in the first place, was because it preserves the idea that this person is actually going to serve as the President of the United States, not technically the American people. And that's a huge debate over whether it should be a popular vote or electoral vote, but one of the strong reasons to keep the Electoral College, and maybe if you have questions later we can talk about it, involved the question of whether or not the states will still be choosing who the President is versus the American people per se. Because he is serving as President of the United States. And that obviously sounds like I'm playing semantics, but it's a very important thing here. And if you go to different websites, you can see different predictions in different states that are solidly in the Democratic column, in this case in blue, or those that are solidly in the Republican column, those in red. And there are many that are up for grabs. And this election is, many you know, um, analysts are arguing, is going to be a lot closer like 2004, for example, or even 2000. Um, than it was in 2008, because there are several swing states. And if you look at some and play some of the electoral math, you know, President Obama can win by, you know, two electoral votes at 272. He can win by six. He can win by eight. 
it's not, doesn't seem to like it's going to be a huge landslide, but we don't know either way. Romney also, the math, if he pulls out these, these um, undecided states, he could also win by, you know, two, three, six, eight. So it seems like it's going to be a very, very close race coming up. So it's very interesting, and we'll have to see how it plays out the next two weeks. Obviously, what may happen, oh, excuse me, what may happen, obviously, with the debate, that's obviously, uh, the next debate is tonight. But before, you know, again, I just wanted to do that briefly about the Electoral College, kind of give you a brief overview before we talk about, obviously, the struggle for suffrage in this country. Something that we all tend to take for granted, that we have the right to vote in this country and that we can choose not to exercise that, road of, that, that right if we choose to. However, yet we see people in other countries literally risking their lives to go to vote. All right? And I think that's an interesting thing for us to consider. Now, in the beginning of American government, the only people that really could vote in this country, it was limited to white males. But even then, in that case, not everybody. They usually had property requirements, for example, which restricted the vote. They usually tried to actually, surprisingly, encourage and enlarge the vote by allowing people, instead of having a certain amount of property, to actually pay a poll tax instead, which today, and I'm going to argue with African Americans, was a discriminatory practice, in the early 1800s was actually used to try to enlarge the electorate, believe it or not. So it's interesting to see kind of how that plays out. But even in a case like Rhode Island, they actually had to go through a rebellion in the 1840s so all white men could vote. So the idea of universal suffrage that we enjoy today was not something that we saw in the early period of American government, in the early period of American history at all. This Door Rebellion in Rhode Island ultimately resulted in a constitution that provided for universal manhood suffrage. But again, it's interesting to say that if this was the case for men, white men, what is it going to be for women? What is it going to be for African Americans? And that's why I think it's interesting to kind of put this in perspective a little bit that most states by the 1840s had granted universal manhood suffrage, but many actually had not. And Rhode Island obviously is going to be the poster child for that kind of an example. Well, as we look at women's suffrage specifically, one of the earliest leaders, you can argue, in the feminist movement was Abigail Adams. And she wrote a great letter to John Adams while he was down in Philadelphia during the American Revolution, where he said, quote, she said, excuse me, quote, remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could, if particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. In many ways, she could be viewed as one of the earliest of these feminist writers and thinkers in terms of arguing. Now, of course, John Adams did ignore her for the most part, as did the rest of the founding fathers. But there was one state that actually took the Declaration of Independence the idea that all men are created equal as a universal concept and took it literally. And that was the state of New Jersey. New Jersey will actually give women the right to vote beginning from the time right after the American Revolution from the 1770s right up until 1807. And then they looked around and saw no one else had given women the right to vote, so they took it away. And now women are gonna have to fight for it, not just in New Jersey, but across this country to try to gain this right of suffrage. And the first meeting to try to bring about women's suffrage, kind of the first women's rights conference, will be held in New York at Seneca Falls. In 1848, the first women's rights conference will be held at Seneca Falls, organized by Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the meeting included about 300 people, and they were calling for 
women especially to gain the right to vote. They called for other things as well. But especially they were calling for women's suffrage. And at this meeting, some men spoke, like Frederick Douglass, for example, the famous writer and, and um, uh, free, um, uh, abolitionist leader, will be speaking at this um, Seneca Falls Convention. And they will actually put together a statement, what became known the Declaration of Sentiments, which actually will paraphrase the United States Declaration of Independence, where it actually begins by saying, quote, we hold all these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Obviously, they're paraphrasing the Declaration of Independence. Well, they go even further than that, where they begin, just like Thomas Jefferson did in 1776, where he had a laundry list of all the things that the British had done to the Americans, in this Declaration of Sentiments, the women actually begin listing all the things that men have done to women over time, over history. For example, they say the history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man towards woman, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has never permitted her to exercise her right to the elective franchise. He has compelled her to submit to laws in the formation of which she has no voice. He has withheld from her her rights, which are given to the most ignorant and degraded men, both native and foreign. He has deprived her of the first right of citizenship, the elected franchise. And they go on and on and on. Women, beginning here at Seneca Falls, therefore, are calling for the right to vote. And they are very much involved in remaking American society during this period. Not just in terms of calling for the right to vote, but also in the realm of the abolitionist movement, the temperance movement, so many of these other social movements in American society that they are really remaking American society. And they actually become very disenchanted when in 1868, right after the American Civil War, when the 14th Amendment, and they really feel abandoned by this in many ways, when the 14th Amendment actually for the first time labels and stipulates that su um, <coughs> suffrage is only for those who are male and 21 of years and eight of old, or older, excuse me, that's the first time we ever see it. And it's written down in black and white. As African Americans are pushing for the 15th Amendment coming in 1870, Frederick Douglass, who was a supporter of women's rights, actually believed that if he included women, it would actually be hurting the women, the, the, um, the struggle for black Americans to gain the right to vote. So he actually said, this is the Negro's hour. And women were pushed aside. They obviously felt very frustrated by that. And some women were going to take it a little bit further. Some women, for example, like Virginia Minor, in 1872, are going to try and push it even further. Because Virginia Minor lived in St. Louis, and she went to vote in the election of 1872. And in 1872, when she went to vote, she was denied the right to vote. So she sues. She sues because she says, that the registrar of St. Louis, a person who happened to be named Happersett, he was denying her, he was denying her one of the privileges and immunities of citizenship, the right to vote. So she sues. The case takes several years before it gets to the US Supreme Court. And in the case of Minor v. Happersett in 1875, the United States Supreme Court looks at this issue and they say very clearly that while women have always been citizens, citizenship does not automatically confer the right of suffrage. And it's interesting. I want to read you a couple passages from this Supreme Court decision. Because they say, quote, when the Constitution was adapted, adopted, excuse me, 
All the citizens of the states were not invested with the right of suffrage. In all, save perhaps New Jersey, the right was only bestowed upon men and not upon all men. That's why I mentioned that earlier about the Door Rebellion and things. If suffrage, they said, was intended to be included within its obligations, language better adapted to express that intent would most certainly have been employed. For nearly 90 years, they went on, the people have acted upon the idea that the Constitution, when it conferred citizenship, did not necessarily confer the right of suffrage. And the Supreme Court Chief Justice said, if the courts can consider any question settled, this is one of them. Do you think the women were going to be satisfied with that decision, though? Were they going to be satisfied? No. Now, as I mentioned earlier, who decides who can vote in all elections? The states. The states have that power, right? So women, after the Minor v. Happersett decision, look and say, we can take a two-pronged attack to try to gain the right of suffrage. They say, we can do it state by state by state, or, and or, we can get a constitutional amendment ratified and be universal and be done immediately. Well, they're going to pursue both paths. And it's actually going to take them over 40 years after Minor v. Happersett to actually realize and be successful in this. And in 1890, an organization, there were a couple earlier organizations that had been founded, but they will merge together into what becomes known as the National American Woman Suffrage Association. And the president was Carrie Chapman Catt. And it will be this organization that will, by the late 18, early 1900s, begin mobilizing middle class Americans, middle class American women, to try to bring about this change and try to guarantee and win this right to vote. This right to vote was not something given to women. This was something that they earned through their blood, sweat, and tears. And for example, they're going to work, as I said, both state by state, and they're also going to work in terms of trying to gain the right to vote by getting an amendment ratified. And the earliest victories women have is by doing it state by state. For example, Wyoming becomes the first state, they were the first territory, and then later the first state to give women full voting privileges. Later on, Colorado and other western states. My question is to you, why Wyoming? Of all places, wouldn't you think there'd be some place like New York or Massachusetts or you know, some place in the East Coast that would be very liberal and progressive and say, no, we need to give women the right to vote. Why Wyoming? Any ideas? Any ideas? Why do you think? Oh, there are fewer women there, absolutely. So what is the thinking if you're the legislators in Wyoming? If we give women the right to vote, what's going to happen? Women are going to start flooding to Wyoming. Beautiful. And then who's going to flood after the women? The men. Beautiful. Wyoming's going to boom and it's going to be a beautiful place. It doesn't quite work out that way. But my point is, isn't that the whole, you know, that, that's the whole genesis behind this? Is that they're trying to use the women, just like today, ladies' nights at bars, right? They're just using you, ladies. I know you don't care, but they're just using you. You know, free drinks, okay, fine. You know, just choosing to get the men to come in, you know. But Wyoming is the same idea. You get the free drinks. I don't know if Wyoming was giving free drinks at the wall, but anyway. But Wyoming is going to attract women, you know, by offering the right of suffrage. And if you look up here, you can see how women will begin winning this right to vote. You can see, for example, in that dark purple, by 1909, women had gained the right of, of suffrage. You see some other states prior to 1918, and look at them, they're all in the West. Partial suffrage, really, in the middle part of this country. And the great interesting area is the areas that held out the longest here in the Northeast especially. Here in the Northeast especially, they're going to hold out as long as possible. For example, prior to 1919, well, in 1917, Rhode Island will allow women to vote only in presidential elections. Maine allows them to vote in 1919. 19 states, though, 
by 1920 will still not allow women the right to vote at all. And they include the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Massachusetts refused to allow women to vote, period. However, the move and the, the struggle to gain the right of, to vote by getting a constitutional amendment ratified, that will happen in the early 20th century. And we see that, for example, that in order for an amendment to be introduced, it can be either introduced by the states with a two-thirds vote or by Congress. And the women's rights, the amendment to guarantee women's equality and the right of suffrage, will actually win passage through Congress and then go out to the states. In order for an amendment to be ratified by the states and therefore become part of the Constitution, what is required is a three-fourths vote of all the states. Now, as we look to August of 1920, the amendment was passed out of Congress in mid-1919. So by a year later, they had about, they had 35 states. They need 36 in order for that amendment to be ratified. All the other states that were remaining had either decided one way or another that they were opposed to it, that they were not going to even, for example, call hearings to actually ratify it or not by that time period. So it comes down to the state of Tennessee in August of 1920. And in August of 1920, the Tennessee Senate approved this ratification, the ratification of the Women's Suffrage Amendment. And it comes down to the Tennessee House. And they're tied. They're tied. The one person who was going to be that individual to break the tie was the person I had up on the first slide or the second slide, Harry Byrne. Harry Byrne had planned on voting against ratifying this amendment, which therefore would have denied women the right to vote. However, he received a little note. He received a note from his mother. <laughs> he was the youngest member of the Tennessee House of Representatives. He was only 24. And his mother wrote to her son, quote, Dear son, Hurrah and vote for suffrage. Don't keep them in doubt. I noticed some of the speeches against. They were bitter. I have been watching to see how you stood, but have not noticed anything yet. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification. Your mother. Whoa, okay. Harry Byrne, at the ripe old age of 24, decides that he's going to vote and, and in favor of the women's rights, in terms of the women's rights amendment, to ratify and get, grant women the right to vote. When he asked, and by the way, there are many stories that have continued on after that, that for example, he had to hide in the attic after casting his vote, because those people that were opposed to the anti-suffragists, for example, were actually going out to lynch him, so he had to hide in the attic. Some people say he actually had to slip out a window and cross a ledge to get out and things like that. So all these great stories. But one, um, when he was asked later on to explain his vote, he listed a couple of reasons. He said, quote, I believe in full suffrage as a right. I believe we had a moral and legal right to ratify but he also included, I know a mother's advice is always safest for her boy to follow. And my mother wanted me to vote for ratification, so I did. You know, he's a good boy. Well, when you look at it ultimately, what does it come down to? One vote ratified the 19th Amendment for this country, which guarantees women the right to vote. Women's struggle from 1848, from the Seneca Falls Convention, to gain this right to vote was finally realized in 1920 with the ratification of the 19th Amendment. The 19th Amendment reads that the right of citizens to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Folks, we say that states can determine who can and who cannot vote. That is unless the federal government supersedes that power. And the 19th Amendment added to the US Constitution 
supersedes and requires all states to abide by this from now on. African Americans are going to fight to gain the right to vote, which they thought they had won earlier, but they're going to have to fight again to try and receive it again in the 1960s. So when we see, for example, women's struggle, it's interesting that what is, in terms of after the American Civil War, we're normally, we normally believe that the issues regarding race and what led to the Civil War were solved and were ended, but it really was just opening a new chapter. Because during this period of Reconstruction, the U.S. government tried to, by, by, through ratification of several amendments, guarantee equal rights for the newly freed slaves, for all African Americans. So there will be three amendments that become known as the Civil War Amendments that are supposed to guarantee African American equality. The 13th Amendment, for example, does anybody know what that one did? Slavery. Exactly. It officially abolished slavery in this country. So the 13th Amendment officially abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment? Oh, someone said it? Granted All citizenship. Exactly. Granted citizenship. Now, one thing that we normally assume is a right of citizenship is the right of suffrage, correct? The right to vote. Well, even though the minor versus half percent decision is a couple years down the pike, we know that citizenship and suffrage do not go together necessarily, correct? So the Republicans in Congress, the Republican Party, obviously the party of Lincoln, the party of emancipation, the party that if the newly freed slaves were going to vote, they would vote solidly Republican. They want to make sure that African Americans can actually vote. So they end up introducing and ratifying the 15th Amendment. The states end up ratifying it, obviously, which guarantees the right to vote to the former slaves, to all African Americans in general, free blacks and, and also the former slaves as well. So they're guaranteed now the right to vote. Although, wait a minute, can I say all of the former slaves can vote? No. Only who? The Only the male slaves, right? Only the former male slaves obviously can actually vote at this time period. Women, again, as we said, whether you're white or black, you still had to wait another, obviously, 50 years. So these Reconstruction Amendments are designed to guarantee their equality. But they're only going to be enforced while the Northern Army is still occupying parts of the South. And even then, there's going to be resistance from groups like the Klan and other organizations as well. And especially beginning towards the end of Reconstruction, but especially in the period post-Reconstruction, the southern states began to take measures to try to prevent African Americans from exercising the right to vote. For example, literacy tests. Anybody guess what is a literacy test? What would a literacy test be, for example? Kurt, what do you think? Exactly. See if you can read and see if you can write. So the literacy test was put in there as an opportunity for the southern states to try to limit and guarantee that all their citizens could actually read and write before they could vote. Now, when you hear that, that actually sounds fairly logical, correct? So they can read and so they can understand the issues and read about the candidates, and that sounds fine. But as it comes out and as it's enforced, every single white person passes the literacy test, and every single African American fails it. And as a result, it's just being used as a method to prevent African Americans from obviously exercising their rights. What they would ask you to do, and I actually have an example here. Let me go to the, back to the internet here for a second. What they would ask you to do, now this is an example from a, a literacy test from 1964, and I know it's, it's kind of tough to release for me reading it underneath here, but it says the applicant will complete the remainder of this questionnaire before a board member and at his instructions. The board member shall have the applicant read any one or more of the following excerpts from the U.S. Constitution using a duplicate form of this insert, part three, 
The board member shall keep in his possession the application with the insert and shall mark thereon the words missed in reading by the applicant. So what is the person supposed to be basically dictating and writing down? Different parts of the U.S. Constitution, such as the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. And these other passages that are kind of tongue twisted, they're asked to read this and, and, and in some cases interpret it and explain it. So any little mistake you had in terms of spelling, in terms of grammar, in terms of anything could be grounds whereby you could fail a literacy test. All right? Now again, this one is from 1964, but you get the idea in terms of exactly what type of testing that these, um, that they use to try to get around the 15th Amendment. Now again, you may be wondering, and wait a minute, I said the 15th Amendment guaranteed all African American men the right to vote, right? Well, how could a literacy test get around that? How could a literacy test get around it? Well, remember, who still determines who can vote in all elections? The states. Now, even though you're telling me that all African American men should have the right to vote, that doesn't mean that the states can't put in these other kinds of obstacles that get in the way. Just like, for example, even though it says that all, you know, all citizens can vote today, that doesn't stop, for example, a state today by saying, if you have a felony conviction, you can't vote, right? Or if you move from one state to another, you have to wait 90 days before you can vote, or 60 days, or whatever it is. So states still are using their powers that are given to them under the Constitution to try to, again, pick and choose who they want to vote and who they don't want to vote. In this case, obviously, they don't want African Americans to vote. So the literacy tests will be used. We see they come up with things, for example, like grandfather clauses, which quite simply says that if you had been able to vote in the 18, let's say, 66, 67 time period, you can vote now. Well, that's interesting, because when was the 15th Amendment ratified? 1870. So obviously none of the former slaves would be qualified to vote in that case, right? But then they also put in this other little um, twist here, too. They said that also, not only that, but if you're a descendant of someone who had voted sometime in the past, okay, again, that excludes all the former slaves, but it includes all white people, correct? So again, they're being very specific. And again, that's where the name grandfather clause comes from. If your grandfather could have voted, then you can vote kind of thing. These grandfather clauses will eventually be ruled unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1915. Jim? Well, what you're telling me with the grandfather clause, wouldn't that also exclude any, um, any immigrants that have moved to the U.S. as well? Aha, uh -huh, but those groups, that's a great question. Jamie asked, wouldn't that exclude a lot of immigrants? Well, in all honesty, that would be a case that a lot of these states would say, we don't want those kinds of people voting either because they're not like us. You know, and, I'm, and that's what I'm saying in the words of what they would be saying at that time period. You know what I'm saying? So they would include that because literacy tests, and I'm glad you brought up that point, literacy tests will not only be used to discriminate against African Americans, but they eventually will even be included in immigration laws that will try to limit the number of immigrants coming into this country in the early 20th century. That you must be able to read or write, you know, 50 words or 80 words, you know, common words in your language or whatever the case may be. So all these things can be used very powerfully to try to either restrict immigration itself or restrict voting rights. So very interesting. So excellent question. Absolutely. We also see things, for example, like the white primary that was used. I mean, by the early 20th century, the Democratic Party had regained control of the southern governments. And the Democratic Party, basically, whoever won the primary for the Democrats, won the election. It's not even a question. The election really was just a formality. The, the primary was where the real election actually happened. So what the Democratic Party argued in the late 18, early uh, 1900s is that they were a um, private institution and that they could choose who they want to participate and who they don't want to participate. And therefore, they excluded all African Americans. 
Eventually, that too will be declared unconstitutional, but it takes time. But it gives you an example of the types of things that go on during this period to actually specify exactly what happens in terms of the, the attempts and the energy that people put in to try to limit the right to vote. And one of the last examples is poll taxes. Now, obviously, what's a poll tax? Right, a tax you have to pay to vote, exactly. A tax you have to pay when you go to vote. Now, these poll taxes will be discriminatory against the poor of any race, color, creed, right? Will discriminate against anybody. So what's interesting is when you look at, here's a poll tax receipt from 1895, and it actually says that the amount of that poll tax, not counting the assessor's fee and the collector's fee, is actually going to be about a buck fifty in 1895. Well, when you hear $1.50 in 1895, you figure, okay, well, that's not so bad. buck fifty. what's the big deal? You know, no big deal. Well, when you translate it to today, it's over $40, roughly. So, I mean, anything that puts any obstacle in the way of someone from voting is going to, bless you, prevent you from actually voting. Don't they talk about that today, that if it's going to rain on election day, voter turnout's going to be way down? You know, if there's snow in the, in, you know, the Midwest or in the, in the Great Lakes area, oh, no, voting's only way down. Because anything that will get in your way is actually going to inhibit people from actually exercising that right to vote. So southern states began passing, again, under the Constitution, they have this, this power to determine who can vote. So they started putting in all these little, little laws, like the poll taxes and literacy tests, to try to stop African Americans from exercising their right. Well, here's, an, uh, that's actually the, what I just showed you before, the literacy test. And this shows you the impact of the literacy test itself. That you see by the 1960s, that only in a place like Texas, 35% of African Americans who were of voting age could, were actually registered to vote. You see in a place like Louisiana, it was 31%, 37 in Arkansas, 14 in Alabama. But the greatest of all, you look at Mississippi, about 5 6% of eligible African American voters were actually registered to vote in Mississippi. Mississippi will be the greatest example of, you know, Alabama's not much better with 14% and things like that. But it gives you an example in terms of how effective these literacy tests, how effective these interpret the Constitution tests were, poll taxes, in terms of inhibiting people from exercising their right to vote. Again, something that we take for granted today. So the modern civil rights movement, as it began in 1954, which began really targeting the issue of segregation, you know, separate lunch counters, separate bathrooms, um, you know, for African Americans, for white people, and so on and so forth. As the, segre as the struggle over segregation was coming to an end in 1964 with the passage of the Civil Rights Act, African Americans were recognizing that, yes, segregation is a key issue. It's something we need to defeat and we're successful in defeating. But what they also recognize is they need to deal with another issue, and that is the issue of suffrage. Because they still, despite the 15th Amendment, they still didn't have the right to vote or were not able to exercise that right. Can anybody think also why, despite other than literacy tests and poll taxes, why African Americans wouldn't even think of going to register to vote? Any other ideas? I mean, those are, you know, in law books and things like that. Ian, what do you think? The Klan. Things like the Klan, the White Citizens Councils, for example, which would basically be, or, you know, organizations, groups that would use violence and intimidation to prevent them from exercising their rights. That would be one example. Anything else? Illuminati. I'm sorry? Illuminati. Illuminati, exactly. So any kind of organization that would try and do that, absolutely. What else? What else? Something that's relatively straightforward that doesn't seem to intimidate, but is very intimidating. You're fired from your job? Yes. What about economic discrimination in terms of you find out that the person who's working for you actually went to register? All of a sudden, ah, that person doesn't have a job any longer. You know? So it's interesting that kind of economic discrimination, the violence, all those kinds of things that are brought together to prevent them from exercising their right to vote. So that's the reason in 1964, Robert Moses is going to begin a voter registration drive, a voter registration movement 
In Mississippi, in the summer of 1964, what becomes known as Freedom Summer, where Robert Moses is going to attract and bring in hundreds and hundreds of people into Mississippi to try to bring attention to this issue of voter rights and the issue that African Americans are not able to vote. And not only that, but what is 1964? Like 2012 and like 2008 and 2004, it's a presidential election year, right? So there's going to be an, a Democratic convention in, in Atlantic City in 1964, and Robert Moses and the people working in, in Freedom Summer in Mississippi want the National Party and want the world to recognize that they had no say. They had no role in picking who the delegates were. So they'll actually establish a separate political party within the Democratic Party called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, where they will actually send their own delegates to Atlantic City and challenge the Mississippi delegation in front of the world, in front of the nation, when LBJ is just waiting for his coronation. Kennedy was killed a year earlier. LBJ is going to get the nomination. It's a done deal. All he wants is a, is a progressive, positive convention that will then lead him hopefully to a victory in November. And what does he have happening? Issues of race and voter intimidation and issues of all these kinds of tactics that have been used come to the forefront here in Atlantic City. Eventually, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party does get some accommodations from the Democrats in Atlantic City. LBJ is able and the Democrats kind of sweep it under the rug for the most part. But that brings attention to the issue. Also attention is brought to the issue when three civil rights workers go missing in the summer of 1964. When James Cheney, Michael Schwerner, and Andrew Goodman go missing and then are presumed dead by early August of 1964, people are wondering, and most people know what has happened, the Klan or one of those white citizens councils, or someone got to them. And they talk to the sheriff, they talk to local police, and what they find out is that these three men were, and by the way, uh, Cheney was African American and Schwerner and Goodman were both white college students from New York, from the North. They were all arrested, they were all processed, and then they were released. That's what the first investigation finds out. Well, you know I can tell the truth, but it's not the whole truth, right? Well, what they come to find out when, F when LBJ sends federal investigators into Mississippi is they find out that, yes, they were arrested, they were processed, and yes, they were released, but they find out one other little interesting information, piece of information. When they were released, they were released to the Klan, who took them out and murdered them. This becomes the basis of that film that was uh, back in the, what, the 1990s or late 1980s, uh, Mississippi Burning, some of you guys may have seen, right? So this becomes the basis of that film. Folks, this is going to bring attention to the inequities in the South as does the march in Selma. In 1965, in March, following up on the Freedom Summer Movement, Dr. King and the other civil rights leaders are going to try to bring attention to this issue of voting inequities. So they plan a peaceful march. King always believed in nonviolence. And when they began this march, what they had to do as they were marching out of Selma towards the capital of Montgomery, is they had to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And as they were crossing this bridge, it becomes much less than a nonviolent protest, but not from the marchers. Waiting on the other side were Alabama state troopers under orders from Governor Wallace to stop the marchers. Clark's policy was on the sideline. We've been that together for years, and they did march, and I'm 
made a gift that is not lawful to say this. You have to disperse. You are ordered to disperse. Go home or go to your church. This march will not be taken. <laughs> Is that clear to you? I've got nothing further to say to you. Folks, that is 1965 in the United States of America. That's not some what we what we tend to think of some you know third world country or some country somewhere else around the globe. This is some place that 40 something years ago, 47 years ago, math. See, I'm quick. Um, 47 years ago occurred, and they were just trying to gain the right to vote. Something that they thought had been won in 1870. Well, Lyndon Baines Johnson goes on television a couple days after that violence. And eventually, through the Selma marches, there were more than just the one march, there actually will result in actually two people dying. A minister from Boston and also a white housewife from Detroit will die during this struggle and just trying to bring the idea of voting rights to the attention of the American public. LBJ goes before the nation and asks and gets the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. And this Voting Rights Act passed in 1965 will outlaw literacy tests in this country, outlaw all of those knowledge of the Constitution tests, and outlaw all of those kinds of things that try to impede African Americans from exercising their right to vote. They also provide federal protection as you try to go to vote. I mean, folks, think about that for a second. You had federal officers all across this country providing protection for American citizens going to register to vote 47 years ago. 47 years ago. Now, the Voting Rights Act doesn't address the issue of poll taxes because poll taxes had been outlawed the year earlier with the ratification of the 24th Amendment in 1964. So they didn't touch poll taxes or anything like that. But the Voting Rights Act is also going to go a little bit further than just outlawing literacy tests and interpret the Constitution test. It actually goes further. And Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act said that certain jurisdictions, certain areas in this country, could make no changes to their voting in terms of to their voting laws, to their election procedures, without gaining permission from the US Attorney General, from the Department of Justice, if it affected minority voting. So they said that you couldn't make any changes in certain jurisdictions that affected voting, you know, the way you vote, the way the elections are run, anything like that, if it affected minority voting, if it made any changes, without actually getting permission from the U.S. Attorney General or the Department of Justice. The problem, as civil rights leaders began to find in post-1965 America, 
is that they, there was nothing mentioned in the Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act that it touched on the issue of intent. How could you prove from the, from the side of the African Americans that when they passed this legislation, it was intended to discriminate against minority groups? How could you prove that? And they found it impossible to prove it in court. And therefore, that leads to a problem. That leads to a question, because the Voting Rights Act is not going to be worth much if you can't prove intent, if you can't change these um, illegal voting procedures. So therefore, in 1982, amendments were passed to the Voting Rights Act, which stated very clearly that any voting practice, regardless of intent, that resulted in discrimination was prohibited. So these 1982 amendments of the Voting Rights Act prohibits any action, regardless of intent, that results in discrimination in terms of voting. This, these 1982 amendments of the Voting Rights Act have made this Voting Rights Act very powerful and one of the most important laws that we see here in terms of the post-Civil Rights America or post-1950s America. And the issue that most minorities face today as it relates to this Voting Rights Act of 1965 is the issue regarding minority vote dilution. Because this is an issue when election laws combine to keep minorities from winning office, from winning elected positions. So this issue of minority vote dilution could be the way the districts are drawn, could be the way that the election procedures, are they at large, are they district elections, it could be based on a number of different criteria. And what many communities have had to do in recent years is make changes to not necessarily guarantee that a minority person will win election from this ward or this precinct, but make it more likely and more possible that this actually will happen. All right, so this Voting Rights Act has changed American society. Just as the 19th Amendment changed it for women, what we see is that African Americans and women, things that we take for granted in terms of the right of suffrage, was something that they fought and died for in the 20th century. When you would normally think that we are a very progressive country, that these would have been guaranteed many years earlier. Any questions, folks, about anything? Any questions about the Electoral College, about this election, about anything? Yes, Nancy. Yeah. Has there ever been a time when the Electoral College did vote in a different president and a different vice president? Oh, excellent question. It actually, that could occur, actually, no, honestly, that could occur this year if they tie. If the Electoral College ties, for example, 269 apiece, the presidency would be decided by the House of Representatives, and in that they vote as states. So more states will be Republican, have Republican control, most, most people argue today. And then the vice presidency will be voted on by the Senate. And if the Democrats keep control of the Senate, they vote as individuals, so we could see that. The only real time that ever happened was with the earliest period of American government in 1796, where you had Thomas Jefferson as the vice president and John Adams as the president. But actually, at that time, they didn't run as party tickets. At that time, they actually had whoever finished first became president, and whoever finished second became VP. So that would be really interesting. You know, if we had like a Romney-Biden, you know, issue or something like that, that would be kind of interesting, yeah. So yes, Jane. This is more of an opinionated question. How would you feel if, if instead of using the Electoral College to vote for candidates, we just use the popular vote instead? Well, I mean, there are strong arguments that you can make for and against maintaining the um, Electoral College, for example. Now, there's actually... Um, some arguments, because I knew, I kind of figured someone would bring up this question at some point. Some arguments to keep it include obviously the issues regarding that, as you can read some of these, the one that I like the most and the one that I think is, is probably the most powerful is the fact that you maintain the federal power sharing arrangement, number four down here, established by the founding fathers where you actually have the states choosing who the president will be. 
Another argument is, is that if there happens to be corruption in one state, by using the Electoral College, you limit that corruption only to one state. It doesn't pollute the whole pool, basically. All right? Um, so that's something that you can think of. But there are arguments against it as well. So some arguments against it, obviously, as you can probably guess, are almost the flip side of what, uh, what the other ones were that I mentioned. That obviously that a candidate who receives a majority of the nationwide popular vote can lose the election. And that's happened four times. That's happened four times in American history. You can argue that every single time, except for one, there were extenuating circumstances. The end of the Civil War period, the breakdown of political parties, Florida, I mean, that's enough, just right there, Florida. Um, you know, so, I mean, you can make those arguments, and the one that was just so close was 1888, where literally it was a handful of votes one way or another through the state of New York to Harrison and not to Cleveland and gave him the election. So, again, to answer your question, Jamie, these are a lot of different reasons, you know, that you can argue to keep it or to go to the popular vote. Um, my thinking always has been, quite frankly, is that if you look in the grand scope of American history and you take all four of those elections that the person who won the popular vote lost the presidency, that ends up coming down to the electoral vote working correctly about 93% of the time. If you take out those three examples that I said that were just extreme examples, you know, Florida and the party system breaking down the Civil War, that percentage rises to something like 98%. I don't know what else in my life works well 93 or 98% of the time, you know what I'm saying? And for me, it keeps that state selecting the president, which I think is, the, is, is really an important thing. But there's strong arguments for and against. So there are a couple of questions I want to get to as well. Yes? Um, why did the voting change from 21 to 18? That is a great question. The, uh, the question was, why did the voting age change from 21 to 18? And actually, the voting age changed. That actually was a big push in the late 1960s, six, the late 1960s into early 1970s, because of the Vietnam War. That you were 18 years of age, and you were old enough to actually go serve in Vietnam, but you were not old enough to vote. So what happened is the 26th Amendment was ratified in 1971, which guaranteed and, and lowered the voting age from 21 to 18. Excellent, excellent question. That's a similar question that a lot of students, when I talk about the 26th Amendment, bring up about drinking as well. Why is the drinking age 21 when we can serve overseas or do this or do that? You know, that kind of thing. So, excellent question. Yes? Um, I was actually going to ask you about the voter ID situation in Pennsylvania. Why does that go against the 1982 law? Well, you see, that becomes the great question, exactly. These new voter... Um, Voter ID laws that have been passed in different states have come under challenge because they're being viewed as almost a new poll tax. Because if you can't afford to buy a, um, an ID or have an ID if you're not driving any longer or something like that, then it's actually an, a, a tax that you have to pay in order to vote. And that's what many of these states, it would be Texas, uh, the Pennsylvania law, for example, the courts are actually beginning to restrict that and look at those more, more closely. Now, Rhode Island just instituted a voter ID law. And what's interesting is, but the state of Rhode Island provided a mechanism where you can actually get a free ID that will be legitimate and that they can use at the polling stations. And again, it becomes a highly politicized issue because is it really to try to clamp down on voter fraud? You know, the old adage, you know, vote early, vote often kind of thing, you know, Chicago and places like that. Or is it actually an attempt to just stop certain peoples from voting again? That becomes the question. And the political parties have different views on, on both of those questions. And that becomes makes it a very politicized issue. You're right. But there's never been an issue of somebody showing up and actually frauding like in person. I know there's been fraud like the rain votes, but I don't think there's ever been a fraud of somebody showing up and acting like somebody else. Well, that's a great question. There's actually, and it's, it's reported, and every year dead people vote regularly in this country. You know, and it could be because if you don't have any, if you don't have anything, I'm sitting there at the desk. You come in, you can say you're John Smith, okay? John Smith may have died five weeks ago, but I don't know who John Smith is. You say you're John, okay, John, come on, vote. You know what I'm saying? The old days in the old type in the late 19th century, where they had the um, uh, political machines and the political bosses and things, they loved a man who had a full beard, because what they would do is take you once to vote with the beard. They would take you back a second time with just the long sideburns like a goatee. 
Then they would shave off the sideburns and the bottom of the goatee and go in with a mustache. And then maybe shave your head or something. I don't know. But they would go, and you could vote like four or five times that way. And again, those are like extreme examples. But that's what some people make the argument about. And I'm not saying, you know, it, it, there are votes in every single election that are fraudulently cast or not counted that should have been counted in the first place. And that's the problem, too, sometimes. Any other questions? Please, great questions, guys. Great questions. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Sure, yes. You, you, gave the, um, you gave the argument on the Republican side against it. Can you please give the argument on the Democratic side? For what? For the um, voter laws? Regarding the voter ID. Right, right. We'll hear both sides. Well, no, no, absolutely. No, I, I thought I gave because I was trying to be general in terms of what I was saying, that it was a political issue. That um, many argue that, and I was trying not to get into the Democrat or Republican perspective, just be more general. Yeah, well, I didn't mean to go that way. Um, I didn't think I did. But anyway, the, what a lot of many people argue is that from the Republican perspective is that what they're arguing is that there's fraud there, so we need to have voter ID. From the Democratic perspective, what they argue is that many of their supporters are too poor, which is the point I tried to make earlier, that it becomes an issue of poverty, and like Rhode Island is saying that if you don't, drive or you don't have a vote, you can get a voter ID you know, card, for example, and be able to vote. So the democratic perspective is that those laws that are trying to impede the right to vote, regardless, you know, because fraud isn't rampant, because fraud is very limited in terms of American elections, that it's just a ploy by Republicans to try to prevent those who normally would vote for Democrats, those perhaps who are elderly or those who are poor or whatever. For, and I hate, and that's why I don't like getting into it, because it gets into these stereotypes that I don't like. Um, that they would actually be denied the right to vote, and that's where we get into some of those problems. Where that's why I said it becomes a highly politicized issue. Right. You know, so I apologize if I tried to present one side, but I'm trying to present both sides. Did you have a question, caller? Oh. Question? Any other questions? Okay, folks, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it.